thank you all for joining for the third Journey to Sovereignty. I'm uh, really excited to, to jump into this one. Um, but for a quick introduction, I'm Seth for Privacy, and um, we're beyond thrilled to have a place for us to chat about all things sovereignty, the why and how of reclaiming your digital sovereignty, and to give you all a chance to chime in, ask questions, and join the conversation. Journey to Sovereignty is brought to you by Foundation, where we build Bitcoin-centric tools that empower you to reclaim your digital sovereignty. This includes our Passport hardware wallet and OnPoint mobile app. For this episode of Journey to Sovereignty, we're going to start a series that deep dives into Bitcoin as a tool for sovereignty. The first and most basic step to getting sovereignty through Bitcoin is holding your own keys. But what's actually the best way to do so? Are hardware wallets or signing devices, as they're some kind, sometimes called, the best tool for everyone? And how do they even work? We're going to dive into hardware wallets today and answer all your questions on the topic. As always, I'm joined by Bitcoin Q&A, Head of Customer Experience here at Foundation, and our CEO and co-founder, Zach Herbert. How's it going, guys? Doing well, Seth. Thank you very much. How about your good self? Doing pretty well. Nice, busy start to the week so far, but uh, I know we've been, uh, we had to push this space a little bit, so I'm excited to, to dive back in. I, I love these, uh, these episodes and, and chance to hear some good questions from the audience, so looking forward to this one. Same here. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, I know that most people probably know that there were not hardware wallets around when Bitcoin started. Uh, it was a, a concept that kicked off around 2013, um, but they've kind of become ubiquitous for cold storage, as it's sometimes called, or, or really just a, a good way to store and spend Bitcoin securely. Um, but I want to kind of, again, go back to the basics and talk about what what's the point of a hardware wallet? And how does it actually change the way we store and spend Bitcoin versus a standard wallet or sometimes called a software wallet or a hot wallet? There's there's always a, a thousand terms for everything in the Bitcoin space. Um, but but what are, what's the real point of a hardware wallet and how does it change how we approach using Bitcoin? Yeah, I think uh, I can kick this one off. Um, so, you know, there's no kind of right or wrong here as to, you know, the best way uh, or the only way to, to store your Bitcoin or to interact with your Bitcoin. Um, as is always the case, you know, there's a lot of nuance around it and generally, uh, you know, a, a bit of a hybrid approach uh, or using the right tool for the job um, is generally the best approach. So you mentioned that we've got hot wallets or software wallets, which are generally uh, internet uh, or on internet connected devices. Um, these are generally uh, accepted as being more for day to day spending uh, for smaller amounts uh, that are easier to access and, and generically uh, somewhat less secure. Uh, and then in more recent years, we've seen hardware wallets come onto the scene um, that are that whose main aim uh, is to separate your all important Bitcoin private keys um, from um, from attackers essentially and make them harder to access or harder to steal um, such that your Bitcoin uh, is is more secure. <clears throat> so I think, um, like I say, the, you know, the, there isn't a, a hard and fast rule as to what you should use and when you should use it. Yes, we can provide some advice on how and when you could do that. And I'm sure we'll get onto that a little bit yeah, later. Generally speaking, most people will use a combination, use a combination of, of uh, multiple, uh, multiple hot wallets or software wallets and also some hardware wallets mainly for potentially their, 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 their savings that they uh, are happy with being uh, a little bit more difficult to access. Um, you know, by design, that's the whole point of it, to uh, to make your private keys more secure such that you are um, not the lowest hanging fruit and not as easy to attack and to steal from. Yeah, and to, uh, to add to that, I think, I think a hardware uh, wallet, wallet serves, serves a couple, a couple of key, of key purposes. purposes. One, One is to give you a single purpose device in order to store your Bitcoin keys and sign transactions. Uh, some devices out there actually separate out the storage from the signing, which I think we can definitely talk about in a bit. Um, so one of them is the single purpose device aspect. Another one is having the device offline at all times, as opposed to a computer or phone, which is either sometimes or always connected to the internet. And then the third, which is another interesting angle, is actually providing... Uh, a good source of randomness when you generate your keys or your, your your seed for the first time. So I would say like a good hardware wallet makes all that much easier than uh, the alternative, which was before hardware wallets, which was just using, you know, a, uh, a computer. 
Yeah, I think that the easier side of things is one that people normally don't think about when they think of hardware wallets. I think we've kind of come to expect using a hardware wallet to increase the difficulty, to increase the complexity of setups. Uh, but there, there are some real advantages that we can gain in actual ease of use there. Um, are there any other kind of key advantages of a hardware wallet that you, you think about when you approach it? Or maybe any, any key disadvantages? I think, I think one of the, the main disadvantages, if you if you look at it that way, is is obviously there's a cost involved into purchasing uh, devices. You know that can range from anywhere between um, you know uh, thirty to forty dollars uh, all the way up to a couple of hundred dollars. So for somebody who's um, storing a very small amount or just starting out in the space, then a hardware wallet that might cost a couple of hundred dollars doesn't make much sense. Um, but for somebody who's got their life savings in Bitcoin and, you know, is very exposed to to the Bitcoin ecosystem and has, stores a lot of their uh, net worth in Bitcoin, then having uh, your private keys on an offline device, such as a hardware wallet, is kind of a, a given that, you you know, it's best practice that you should be doing that. Um, purely for the fact of, like I say, making yourself more difficult to attack. Um, and the fact that it is your savings means that you don't need such ready access to those funds, um, both for yourself and for attackers as well. Um, and I think the other one, just circling back on the um, on the uh, attack surface or the attack uh, methodology, um, having uh, your keys uh, stored offline on a hardware wallet means that you are... Uh, you you need to be somebody needs physical access to that device uh, to be able to gain access to your funds, uh, which uh, makes attacking you exponentially, exponentially more difficult than somebody just being able to remotely access uh, your phone via some malicious software or your laptop via again some malicious software. Um, that kind of opens you up to potential attack vectors anywhere on the globe. Whereas if your private keys have never touched the internet they're on a device that can't talk to the internet, it's got no Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, et cetera, then that means that somebody can't attack you from the other side of the globe. They've got to kind of get into your house or wherever you store in your hardware wallet and then subsequently break the, the physical uh, access security, such as a pin code, to get into the device and then try to spend your Bitcoin. So the, the, um, the shift or the exponential growth that you get in terms of security uh, is... You know, it makes yeah. that that small outlay at the start um, more than worthwhile in terms of the protection that you were you were to gain from that. I think there's another trade off uh, that has been cited more and more recently in the Bitcoin space with hardware wallets, which is general, general purpose hardware versus a hardware wallet that may be targeted with something called you know like a supply chain attack, right? So one of the biggest criticisms that I see of hardware wallets today is. How do you know you can trust the maker of the hardware wallet? How do you know that that device was not already compromised in some way before it gets to you? And so I think it's interesting because prior to hardware wallets, the golden standard was putting Bitcoin on a you know laptop uh, with something like you know maybe like installing a fresh uh, Linux uh, install, uh, maybe even removing the Wi-Fi card and using like this uh, general purpose laptop as the signer and even passing even the USB drives, you know, back and forth between your online machine and your offline machine. You know, I did that personally when I started in the space before hardware wallets existed. And then we have hardware wallets. And now I'm starting to see as well, like a call to return to more um, um, general purpose uh, hardware. And so I think that'll be uh, some other interesting things we can unpack today. Yeah, I think that's where the kind of the separation between a hardware wallet that's designed to store or to, to sign with Bitcoin keys versus just an air-gapped wallet comes into play. Because th there are lots of ways that you can create an air-gapped wallet like you were talking about. I mean, a, a common one is also using something like a, a Tails OS, not connecting to the Wi-Fi, uh, using a degenerate seed store on, a, on an encrypted partition. Like there have, there have always been lots of different ways that you can create a kind of a build-your-own air-gapped hardware wallet. But the risks then come in, and how do you know if any of the hardware on that uh, laptop is compromised. How do you know that when you're swapping files back and forth, you're not exposing those keys to something? Um, there's a lot of other kind of trade-offs that come to play when you're looking at that. So I think that's why looking at a hardware wallet from both the perspective of securing the keys on the device and having the air gap um, is a, an important combo and one that 
that maybe gets overlooked for for how important that is. Um, but like, how important do the two of you view an air gap design when you're when you're thinking about designing a, or selling or using a hardware wallet? Yeah, I can I can start. Um, I think the air gap is important, and maybe just we should define an air gap. Um, so all hardware wallets are offline, meaning that they're not connected to the internet. Uh, but there's different ways that you can interface with hardware wallets. So the most common one always was just by plugging it into the USB port in your computer, and it required that you you know use your computer. And there's some devices like like Trezor, you know, is probably the most popular one that really requires the you know plug in the USB port into the computer. Um, another option is wireless technology like Bluetooth, or we're starting to see NFC gain some popularity, though it's still kind of early there. And then the third is like a full air gap, meaning that there's no kinds of wireless communications, and we commonly see something like a micro SD card, or like with Passport, we use a camera and QR codes in order to pass data back and forth. Um, I think having an air gap uh, gives you by far the best security because it reduces uh, the attack surface. Um, so I would say that an air gap is definitely not required um, because I think you know you could you could still be secure. Uh, I, I think just having an offline device itself is a huge benefit. Um, however, I think having the air gap gives you kind of like a best in class you know, um, protection when it comes to thinking about the different kinds of attack vectors that, you know, Bitcoiner uh, will experience. Yeah, the only other thing I'd add around the, the air gap concept is I think an important thing for people to keep in mind is has a device ever been connected to an online, um, to a network? Because if you think about like you repurposing an old laptop for your Bitcoin keys, ripping out the Wi-Fi card, that may that would give you an air gap then, but if the device had been compromised in the past, and then you, or you ever connected it in the future, um, there are BIOS level malware uh, root kits that can be installed on a computer. And then even if you over override it, even if you run Tails OS, even if you run like Linux and it had Windows on it before, that infection could persist. And then if you ever connected to the internet again, that your keys could have been compromised and, and then sent to that point. So. There's also the aspect of like, has the device ever been connected to the internet and could it have malware um, as, as a part of that? And I think that's where something that's purpose built to be air gapped has some advantages there. Um, but obviously that, that usually comes at the cost of um, increased actual <laughs> cost in, in money because you can kind of use general purpose hardware to build your own air gapped wallet. Um, but if you want something that was air gapped from when it was built at the factory, uh, that's usually going to cost extra money, of course. Yeah, I think yeah. the the other thing that's worth considering, uh, like you say, th there's many different ways you can achieve an air gap, and it depends on the device that you're working with. Um, referring to purely to hardware, well, it's one of the main ways uh, that you can achieve an air gap and communicate with with software in a secure way uh, is via QR codes, which is one of the ways that we've implemented with Passport. Um, I think aside from the the additional security that you gain that Zach covered off earlier, um, it's a big leap in UX as well. Um, in terms of, you know, not having to, to fumble around for USB cables uh, or worry about if you've got the right drivers on your laptop um, or looking around for a micro SD card to pass that PSBT back into, um, being able to just simply scan a QR code that's on your phone or your computer uh, and then pass that sign transaction back across to your phone or your computer by the device is showing you the QR code in a couple of seconds is a huge leap. Um, um, in terms of usability and speed of, at which you can make uh, these transactions, which um, highlights the the, um, the interesting overlap that sometimes security and UX has, uh, particularly in terms of like rolling your own air gaps. Um, we, you know, we saw um, uh, it wasn't necessarily air gapping, but we saw the the one of the potential uh, pitfalls of rolling your own security system with uh, the Luke Dash Junior. Um, situation a couple of weeks ago where um he he didn't uh trust 
pretty much any hardware wallet. Um, so he rolled his own um, security system using, I believe, a, a variant of Linux. Um, clearly, you know, there was some holes in that setup and, you know, the the details of which are probably out of the scope of this conversation. But um, the, I guess the bottom line is that even if he'd have had uh, a basic hardware wallet, um, that even one that potentially wasn't air gapped, then he would have been in a more secure situation than he is now, and he, he would have a couple of hundred Bitcoin more in his in his cold storage than he does today, unfortunately. Um, so there's a lot to be said about UX and simplicity, um, additional to to the security aspect of air gap, and I think that's uh, worth remembering because you know most people aren't computer scientists, they're not Bitcoin core developers, they don't have the time to work out how to take the Wi-Fi card out of a Linux laptop and to make sure that it's fully offline and not connected to the internet before they interact with any Bitcoin. Um, air gapped hardware wallets just take all of that headache away from, from you um, and just make that same level of security, if not even better, uh, 10 times easier to, to actually use and interact with. Yeah, totally agree there on the user experience. I think using a camera and QR codes provides a really nice blend of best in class security with reduced attack vectors from you know having an actual like, physical air gap um, and then the usability, as you mentioned, especially if you're using uh, Passport, let's say with a with a mobile wallet that supports you know QR codes, because um, it's really quick, really fast with like a, a cell phone uh, camera. Uh, one thing though, I, I did want to you know add is that I'm not like an air gap maxi. <laughs> like even though we design Passport to be air gapped, um, I think there's probably architectures that you could do to create a more secure uh, hardware wallet that uses Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or NFC and so on. Um, but what, what I've seen from uh, most of the devices, especially the devices that are using Bluetooth, uh, is that they typically are using uh, Bluetooth on the same chip that is running like the operating system for the hardware wallet. Um, I think if you were to treat like wireless uh, chips in a un, like in an untrustworthy way if you were to assume that when you're adding any wireless technologies to a hardware wallet that uh you know you can't trust anything that it's doing you could use it as like a dumb way to pass data back and forth and you can kind of encrypt the data you know beforehand before passing it off to like a bluetooth chip for example um but we don't really see that happening right now with hardware wallets. So I would say that, you know, the architectures need to come a long way in order to provide a wireless experience that also has a really high level of security. I think the no brainer for us when we were working on Passport was to say, let's go right for the QR code air gap because it provides such a good combination of uh, security and uh, usability. And one last thing to add on there, I, I'm glad that you brought up the, the Luke Dash Jr. situation Q&A because I think that that has scared a lot of people off of self-custody or has made them kind of worried about how they're approaching their setups. And when I think about kind of like modeling out what I'm trying to protect against, so, and this is a common concept called threat modeling, um, where you think about what you're trying to protect, who you're trying to protect it from, and what lengths you're willing to go to do that. One thing to keep in mind is that criminals or people who want to steal your Bitcoin they play a risk reward game. If something is extremely risky to them, they're going to be much, much less likely to actually try and attack you and steal your Bitcoin. So when you have Bitcoin in a hot wallet on a server that's connected to the internet and that's publicly known to be tied to you, you open up a ton of risk because someone can hack in, get the Bitcoin and move them all using uh, things like the Tor network, there there are much easier ways to remain anonymous, to hide your tracks, to to be able to, be able to do that that hack without exposing yourself to much risk as the criminal. But when you come to even just a basic hardware wallet, and maybe not one that's air gapped, maybe not one that has a secure element, which we'll get into that next, but even just a basic one where if that host is compromised, you're not directly exposing keys, would mean that an attacker would have to physically come into your home or come into your uh, wherever you're storing a hardware wallet and take it if there's a passphrase they didn't have to get the passphrase from you or hack into some other thing like your bitwarden or something like that to get it 
And the, the risk for the attacker goes up and up and up and up exponentially, which means they're much less likely to go after you, especially if you don't have like thousands of Bitcoin and you're telling the whole world you have thousands of Bitcoin. So I think a lot of it is doing as much as you can to increase the risk to an attacker without increasing the complexity for yourself so that you're not losing keys, but you're also not making yourself just simple, low-hanging fruit. Because um, criminals who want to steal Bitcoin are really, they're, they're looking for targets of opportunity. They're not going to uh, put in a ton of effort and go through a ton of risk unnecessarily. Um, so I think that's a, a key when I look at hardware wallets as a tool and, and something that I think we saw from the Loop Dash Jr. situation as, as a, another reason why you should be really careful and, and use some sort of extra protection like a hardware wallet uh, when storing Bitcoin. Um, but before we jump into the next question, just a quick reminder for uh, the audience out there, uh, just as normal, we're going to have the Q&A time at the end of our, our chat today. Um, so be sure if you have any questions, go ahead and get those ready, write them down if you want to. Um, and in a little bit, we'll go ahead and open it up. I'll call people up on stage uh, and we'll, we'll roll through some questions. So if you do have a question, hang on to it. We'll get to those. And we're always excited for that, that portion of, of Journey to Sovereignty. Okay, that said, um, the next big question, and and this is one that I think has been growing in kind of divisiveness, and it's a it's a big topic in Bitcoin Twitter, which is secure elements, and ultimately, what role do secure elements play in hardware wallet security? Should they play that role, um, and and what are they really about? Um, obviously, we use a secure element on Passport, um, so obviously, we see some benefits in it. But I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts on on this whole kind of secure elements debate that's going on right now. Um, maybe with a really quick intro into what secure elements even are. Yeah, I can I can start that one. Um, so a secure element is basically a chip that is designed to be resistant against physical attacks or against any kind of attempt to break into the chip and extract any kind of secrets that the chip is storing. Uh, so there's many different kinds of secure elements. Um, some of them, uh, you know, have, uh, I, I would say different uses than others. And you can actually use the secure elements in, in different ways. And we actually see, um, we see exactly that in the hardware wallet space based on how the secure element is used, for example, on passport or, Bitbox or cold card versus how it's used on Ledger versus how uh, it's, it's not used, for example, on Trezor. Um, so one of the common criticisms about secure elements is that they're effectively black boxes. Um, usually uh, when you're using a secure element chip in your hardware design, you have to send an NDA with that chip manufacturer and only then can you get access to the data sheet, which explains all the different functionalities that the chip has. So that's different from using something like a normal uh, microprocessor, where you can just go download the data sheet on any website and see exactly how the chip works. Um, so that's, that's one common criticism. Uh, but I think what's really important to note is that all chips are effectively closed source. So whether you're using like a secure element or whether you're using just a normal microprocessor or whether you're using the uh, processor that's in your phone or on your laptop, um, every single chip is basically a black box. So we uh, use a secure element by microchip um, and mo there's, there's a data sheet available online that uh, is not under NDA uh, so that you can at least download and view the data sheet and kind of understand the basic chip, fun chip functionality. So that's one thing. And that's the same chip that we use and Bitbox uses uh, and Cold Card uses as well. Uh, if you don't have a secure element, then your hardware wallet is vulnerable to in-person physical attacks. So for example, if you were to take someone's Trezor device, which does not have a secure element and you pry open the case, you can, you can um, um, pull the pull seed off of, off a, of a treasure in about, in about 15, 15 minutes, minutes with like $100 worth of yeah. hardware. It's a fast, well-documented attack. Um, and you can do that to any treasure device. So unless you're using a strong passphrase with the treasure device, or unless you're using multi-sig, uh, by not including a secure element, 
you know, you're basically giving up the in-person physical security. Now, of course, as, as you know, both Seth and Q and A have, you guys have mentioned in this conversation, it still requires that, you know, someone shows up at your door and, and obtains physical access to your hardware wallet. So that's already a huge hurdle, but it's something really important to know. So the way we use the secure element is, you know, we only use it really for two things. One is it's secure key storage slots. Um, and two is um, a counter to count the number of pin entry attempts. So, you know, Passport automatically bricks itself after 21 pin attempts. And the secure element is keeping track of those. And each time you try to enter a pin and you get it wrong, it increases the counter. And then also the key storage slots are designed to be really hard to pull data from. So if you want to pull any data from it, you have to take the device to a lab. You have to grind down the top of the chip. You have to shoot lasers at it. Uh, it's a risky attack. It's it's an expensive attack. It's an expert level, you know, lab based attack. And so it's much harder to do any kind of physical attacks against, you know, a passport or a bit box or a cold card. Um, the only other thing I'd say is that the way Ledger uses a secure element is very different. Um, they actually run an entire secure operating system that's completely closed source inside the secure element. And the secure element is also a total black box. So we have absolutely no idea how a ledger device works on the inside. We have no clue. As opposed to something like Passport where, you know, all the firmware is open source, all the hardware designs are open source. Um, we're not actually uh, running any proprietary code on the secure element. Uh, so I would say it's much more transparent and additive to Passport's security. Yeah. One of the one other thing that I think about when I think about secure elements is who are you protecting against when you're thinking about someone physically getting your hardware wallet? And for most people, it's actually not a criminal. It's some family member. It's a friend you have over to the house. It's uh, someone, I mean, the, the common name for the attack is evil maid because it's someone who you've paid to come into your house and maybe clean up. They're, they're digging through uh, a drawer to clean up and they find your, um, your ledger, your treasure or whatever. If you have the, the threshold to actually break the physical security of the device high enough, it's not going to be worth their time to actually try. And maybe they take it, but they're not going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to, to do these sophisticated lab laser attacks. But if it is a, a relatively trivial, well-documented online, uh, low-end cost attack, maybe they're going to be much more likely to, to say, okay, I found this guy's treasure. I know this thing has something to do with Bitcoin. And then I have a techie friend who can help me figure out what we can do with this. And maybe they're able to, to get the keys off because there's no secure element protecting it there. So again, it's, it's, being thoughtful about who you're protecting against. And I think secure elements are a, a valuable tool in a, a layered approach to security. And again, not depending entirely on the secure element for security, not depending entirely on it for random number generation, not depending entirely on it for seed storage. There, there's lots, lots of ways we can minimize the exposure since it is a black box. Um, but there's a lot of value gained from adding it in as another layer of protection, another piece of the, the toolkit that we have with a, a hardware wallet itself. Um, but any other thoughts on, on secure elements here? Yeah, I just think that there's been a lot of FUD flying around on Twitter and about secure elements. And, you know, I think there's a lot of nuance here as we're discussing today. Um, it really depends on what model you use and how you use it in the hardware wallet design. Um, the idea that a secure element is closed source um, means absolutely nothing because every single chip is closed source. And I really want to emphasize that. Um, it's something that is not discussed enough in the Bitcoin community. Every single chip is a black box. Um, even if you want to make an open source secure element, you would have a really hard time doing so. I know that there's a Trezor uh, sub subsidiary called um, Tropic Square that is working on like an open source secure element design. But the only way to make a truly open source chip is really like a single foundry in the world <laughs> called Skywater. And they have open sourced their 130 nanometer chip process. Um, chips today are seven nanometers, five nanometers, 
uh, secure elements that you'd buy, probably uh, 16 nanometers, 28 nanometers. Uh, so this is a very old chip process, like a multi-decade old chip process. And then you could probably go about making a very basic open source secure element with some very basic functionality and actually have the entire chip design open source. Otherwise, you're going to a foundry, you're signing an NDA with the foundry, you're getting what's called a process design kit, and you have a lot of proprietary components in your chip. So maybe the Tropic Square guys will be able to open source some of their chip, and they'll definitely be able to make sure that the data sheet is available without an NDA, but there's no way to do a fully open source chip really today that's truly usable inside of a device like a hardware wallet. And so the whole like uh, secure element closed source stuff is I would say really FUD. And I would say that, you know, if as long as you're using the secure element to add security, instead of depending on proprietary code running on the secure element, that additive security is hugely beneficial when it comes to physical in-person attacks. Uh, I love that you hit on the importance of open source in the broader design of the hardware wallet and in the design of the the software that's running on the hardware wallet as well. Um, Cause I think that's another, another key aspect of hardware wallet security and trust minimization. Uh, that's really important when you're thinking about what hardware wallet you want to use and the, the hardware and software being open source as much as possible. Like you said, secure elements are closed source. Uh, every general purpose processor is closed source, unfortunately on the hardware level. Um, but how do y'all view the importance of, of the hardware and software being free and open source, specifically the software being completely free and open source and the hardware being as open source as possible, um, uh, within the constraints of, of how, uh, um, general purpose compute architecture works today. Yeah. Good yeah. segue, Seth. Um, yeah, open yeah. source is a, is a topic that we is spoken about at length, uh, within the Bitcoin space. Um, I think before I kind of get into that, it's worth, uh, taking a quick recap as to why we're, we're all here in terms of, you know, we're all taking personal responsibility to, um, secure our own wealth, um, and be the sole custodian of our savings, of our spending, um, just of our general wealth. Um, so that, that kind of leads me on to why would you want to store um, the access to that wealth um, in a device that you don't know what's happening uh, inside? Um, that would be a closed source device. Um, why would you put trust into that device uh, when you have no idea uh, what's going on in, in there? Um, you know, there could be um, malicious software in there. And if you've got no way to verify that, or at least be... Um, able to know that other people who are more technical than you do have the ability to go and verify the software that's running on that device. Um, it, it just um, makes no sense to, to store your wealth there because you're, you're essentially putting absolute uh, unequivocal trust in whoever's making that device that they're not going to rug pull you in 10 years time and take all of your Bitcoin because like say it's a black box, you have no clue what's going on in there. That's one aspect, and that's what we call kind of source viewable uh, or being able to read the code. That's just a very small part of what open source truly is. It's a very important part, don't get me wrong. Um, but another aspect of, of open source or free and open source software and hardware um, is the ability to innovate on other people's work um, and the free having the freedom to um, to stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, that's a... a, a um, an adage that's used quite a lot in the open source space um, or being able to build on top of other people's hard work enables rapid innovation and it enables better products for customers, more secure products for customers because there's more eyes auditing, auditing the same code over and over again. And there's um, basically everybody's a winner with open source because like I say, that everything becomes more secure. Everything's done out in the open. Um, Iterations are made more quickly, uh, and the end result is, you know, a better uh, hardware wallet. You know, given the subject that we're talking of. So, uh, yeah, open source is huge. Um, open source hardware, uh, the software is the most important in my opinion. But open source hardware is also um, a great way for you to be able to audit that 
um, you know, the circuitry and the, the chips and everything that are interacting with the software that anybody is able to audit um, are where they say they are. And, you know, that there is um, the ability for two people to go away and reproduce Passport if they wanted to. We, we open source all of our schematics. They can go and print their own cases if they want. Everything, all the STL files, everything like that is all open source and anybody can go and take what they want, build it, sell it, as long as they... Uh, open source their code as well that's a stipulation in our in our what we call copy left open source license um as long as they uh continue to to remain that their fork or their version of our software is uh is, is also open source uh, that ensures the viral the viral nature of of the, the license that um foundation and many others uh, in the space choose to ensure that ultimately the customer or the end you know the end user um is a winner and they get the best possible and the most secure uh, product available yeah and I, I i love the the virality of open source code and open source hardware and just the ability for people to iterate on it without having to sign an nda without having to um to to prove that they're not going to be a competitor or anything like that but uh, that's one thing we're like we welcome people to to use our software to look at our open source hardware designs. And, and that's something where competition breeds innovation in the open source space in a way that it just it simply can't in the, the old intellectual property approach that has been ongoing, where you just get tons of industrial espion espionage and um, a lot of predatory practices that ultimately harm the end user and drive up costs, where when things are truly free and open source, um, and hopefully have at least some sort of like copyleft license like ours that ensures that any derivative work will also be open source. You get this cascade, this snowball of innovation that really aids everyone. Um, and it, it, it leads to tools that are both verifiable and better and better over time as even competitors, if they're both truly following this open source model, even competitors will be constantly improving each other and pushing innovation harder and harder than would normally be happening in kind of the old intellectual property approach. So there's so much value there, even if you don't look at the the source verifiability, um, which I think that's a, a whole other discussion. And most people can't, they don't have the technical knowledge to go line by line and code and understand what it's doing. Um, but a big part that that gets added there is that when a, a, when a, like for instance, when a hardware wallet is open source software and hardware and people want to build on it to maybe build competitive products, maybe to build their own firmware that does special things, the more people that are working on it, the more eyes that are on the code of, of technical people who understand what's going on, the less likely there are going to be bugs, the less likely there are going to be security vulnerabilities. You have a better and better, uh, uh, a better and better approach to providing security through visibility instead of security through uh, obscurity, which is is kind of again the the old model. So there's there's so much to love in the free and open source approach to things, and it's it really is a vital part of Bitcoin and the ecosystem building around it. So I hope that we'll see more and more um, people, even in the hardware wallet space, focus on being free and open source um, from the very beginning. Yeah, a couple of perfect examples of of free and open source software and the virality and the, the benefit that the end users get, you know, in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, you know, if it wasn't for free and open source software, we wouldn't have a desktop native Whirlpool client in Sparrow Wallet. We wouldn't have an awesome uh, plug and play node option in Ronin Dojo that leverages the Dojo software from the Samurai Wallet team. Um, and, you know, a, a part of the cryptography library uh, that's used in Passport today is was built by the Trezor guys and is still ma maintained by them. So, you know, we owe a lot to them and the, the, the hard work that they've done and open, you know, and the nature that they open source that. We've benefited from that and so have our customers. Um, so, yeah, just a couple of examples of, you know, what free and open source software enables and the, the types of products that are out there today because free and open source exists. Yeah, yeah, those are really good, really good real world examples, which are, are helpful for people to see that this isn't just kind of a, a theory, but this is is how it actually works in real life, which is is so valuable. Um, the last question here, um, and this is, I think, a, a common one that we get when talking about hardware wallets, um, and it's it's really how are we able to reduce the risk that comes with having a Bitcoin hardware wallet shipped to us? Like, obviously, a Bitcoin hardware wallet is designed to store Bitcoin, so if we buy it and have it shipped to our house... The company knows then that we we want to own Bitcoin, that we're storing our Bitcoin on their device. If that company got hacked and they weren't storing the data well in purchases, that could open up vulnerabilities to people being able to see 
where people live that they own Bitcoin. I mean, Ledger is a perfect example of this, um, where a list of who owned Ledger devices, where they lived, et cetera, was, was leaked. So I know a lot of people's concerns are, how do I buy a hardware wallet without exposing my address, without exposing my identity um, as much as possible? So are there some key ways that people can approach reducing that risk for themselves? Yeah, this is kind of um, dependent on where you're where you are in the world, what your jurisdiction is as to what's going to be available for, to you. Um, some of the most commonly used ones uh, would be a PO box or a postal box or a, a mailbox um, that you can sign up to with uh, a service in your country um, and have uh, items delivered to that that doesn't have your your name or your home address on it. Uh, you can think of it like a, a middleman for, for your post um, such that it breaks that link between you uh, and the Bitcoin company that you're purchasing the hardware wallet from. Obviously, there's a cost associated with that um, and they're not available everywhere, but it is a good option if you do have one, uh, particularly if you're getting multiple items shipped you know, regularly, then it could be worthwhile, the additional cost. Um, one Another great way would be to buy physical hardware wallets in person for meetups, conferences. Uh, you know, you can pay in cash um, so that there isn't any trace in your bank account and there isn't any physical trace you know there's no postman ha handling the device uh, so that's the simplest one but obviously there's only so many conferences and there's only so many meetups so again just depends what's available to you in your personal location and um, at all that uh, another technique that i quite like and again depends on where you work is to get stuff shipped to your work address and um, yes that could glean a certain level of information about you uh, as a person if you were to use your full name um, but you can all, always uh, look at it as you're sort of hiding uh, in the anonymity set of however many people work at your address as well uh, particularly if you don't put your name on it so that could be a good um opportunity or a good solution to that um probably worth checking with your boss beforehand so that you don't uh, get yourself into trouble um on the payment side of things and um, to sort of break the link between your your bank knowing that you're purchasing from hardware wallet manufacturer x is obviously to pay uh, in bitcoin and um, bonus points if that bitcoin is bought from a kyc free source such as a peer-to-peer -peer market like bisco or huddle huddle and um, outside of that just make sure that the bitcoin's been uh, through a coin join implementation like whirlpool to break the the link between uh, your personal identity if you bought it from a kyc exchange and um, so that's a great option from the payment side um yeah and and again the i guess the final thing would be to make sure that you're purchasing from a company that uh values um not values your data but takes your data management very seriously uh you know you mentioned legend and the horrifying hack that they went through a couple of years ago and the the level of information that was shared there on their customers was was shocking quite frankly um luckily that woke a, a number of companies up uh, in the space um and a lot more a lot more companies are, are starting to take that data retention more um a lot more seriously and i give you an example a foundation um 60 days after your uh, device has left our factory all of your data is automatically erased we just keep um some uh nondescript uh you know no no personal identification just for our, our records in terms of what was sold and when it was sold there's nothing your address your name your email address everything like that is all gone after 60 days so um you know we don't want to be looking after that data for any longer than we have to we keep it just so that we can deal with any issues with shipping or returns or anything like that um thereafter it's gone um so that the date if it's not there it can't be stolen so there's some good uh, tools and techniques anyway awesome thank you for the the compre comprehensive answer there q a um i think you, you you covered pretty much everything that i was thinking in that that area, the only little note I would add is um, that we're excited this year at conferences we attend to be able to sell passports in person. Um, so we're still kind of planning out which exact conferences we'll be sponsoring or attending this year. But um, keep an eye out on Twitter for announcements of where we'll be. And if you want to buy a passport, that is really the, the best and most privacy preserving way is to be able to just walk up to a, maybe our booth at a, a conference this year and buy a passport directly from us. Um, so excited that we'll have everything in stock. We'll be able to roll with that and, and actually do that in a, a much more privacy preserving way this year. Thanks for jumping in for this episode of Journey to Sovereignty. And I hope you'll join us for our next live Twitter space every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. GMT. Joining us live gives you a chance to listen in, participate, and get your questions answered on the spot. Follow us at FoundationDVCS on Twitter to keep up with the latest news, get notifications when we go live, and much more. 
See you at the next one. And thanks for joining us on the journey to sovereignty.